Hi guys, sorry about that, but I live in Nigeria and they're part of life. <laughs> so I had to wait for them to put on the generator. Um, okay, so she's back. Okay, so we'll just continue where we left off. Sorry about that. Nigerian problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, Don't worry, I understand. <laughs> yeah. So please, um, you were saying about yes. what so, about your your financial journey advocacy journey. Yeah. So um like I was saying, I had you know, I had a situation on my finances. I realized that I was deep in debt. I was owing so many people. Um, and I was borrowing to fund my lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, which was, you know, worse. And then I had, I could not pinpoint a feasible payback strategy. And that made it worse. But it was not like if I was, you know, between a rock and a hard place right now, and I had to pay those monies, I had a way to pay them, mm -hmm. you know, and that really pushed me. And then when I read your book, that was the and first that time. Point, what was your... What was your were you in school at the, at that point? Like, do you know why yeah. you were, you were, were you still in okay, school why, at that point? Yes, yes, I was still in school. I had just started off. I think I was probably in my second year um, at my current school. So, yes, I was in school at that time. But I know that the, well, I say the breakthrough really happened when I was home for one of the holidays. And I read your book, I think, a second time. And then that was when I really understood the meaning of net worth because I hadn't understood the importance of knowing my net worth. And so that day I decided to calculate my net worth and I was crying literally. Like I was shedding tears because my net worth was in the negative and because it was because of death. Yes, because of death. So even though I was making some form of, you know, little money from my businesses, they couldn't even cover the amount of my debt. And that really, it just, like, it was like that eureka moment that, look, if you don't take charge of your life, you're going to be in, like, a deep mess. So that just pushed me. I read your book again. I started reading other books, you know. And then I started my journey, started recording my lessons, um, getting to know how I could manage my finances better, and that was what sparked up my journey. And I realized that, you know, other young people were going through the exact same thing I was experiencing. And I just didn't want anyone to be in that place. There were days I cried, you know, and oh my days. So, yes, that was how I started. It can be a very painful um, process. So people are always asking me why I start with net worth. Um, and it's because they don't really teach us in school. They always say to us, um, work hard, get a good job so that you can earn a good salary um, or start a business, which is like the more common thing. But it hits me, if you've listened to my podcast, which yes. I launched this week, I shared yes. that one of the biggest money mistakes that I made was when I was measuring my financial success based off of how much I earn and how much I could spend as opposed to how much uh, my, the value of my net worth. And it hit me that they don't teach us what's the value, mm -hmm. what our net worth is. Nobody tells us to calculate our net worth. When we hear the word net worth, it is um, it's associated with wealthy people. Rich people, yes. Yeah, it's associated yeah. with, you know, the Forbes list. Like, so we always think, mm -hmm. oh, we'll start worrying about net worth when we have blown, right? Yeah. But nobody yeah. teaches us how to keep and grow our money in any formal framework. We're just mm -hmm. meant to magically figure it out when we, <laughs> when we get our first jobs. <laughs> and <laughs> which is why a lot of young people they make so many mistakes first before they realize that. So like you going into debt, not understanding what, um, what it actually means to be wealthy. So in my book, the first <laughs> chapter is explaining to you what wealth really means. And it blows my mind how they don't tell us. So in our yes. case, we equate mm -hmm. the money in our bank account with 
um, how well, much you yeah. can afford, right? Or how well mm-hmm. you're doing financially. But if that money is staying all in your bank account and it's not earning uh, money, it's not working hard for you, then you yeah. are, um, then you're in trouble, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because inflation, <laughs> because so many <laughs> different things, you know, are happening. Right. But I think yeah. the biggest thing for me was understanding what financial freedom really. Um, means, which is basically finding a way to systematically build assets that can pay you in the future, right? Um, but yeah. we don't, we don't, we don't, we're not taught to strategically think like that. So the no, idea we're is not. we're only going to work, we're young now, we're agile now, but we're only, we only have a finite number of years to work, right, in our lifetime. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the question is, by the time you get to that point, right would you Mm -hmm. be maintain the same lifestyle that um, or would you be able to afford the lifestyle that you have now and for most people the answer is no because they don't have any assets even if they make Mm -hmm. a hundred million they spend a hundred million with nothing Mm -hmm. to show for it in terms of assets that can provide them with an income um in the future and i feel like if somebody had told us that right (laughs) from the beginning like from even secondary school or university that really what, mm-hmm. what you're working for is okay spend, find a balance between spending on lifestyle but systematically build assets that can pay you in the future so that a your money is working for you your rent out you yeah. get to a point where like your passive income can pay for your lifestyle to me yeah. that's when you're really wealthy when you you can use the dividend um the dividends from your stock portfolio to pay yeah. for your um, pay for your, your ticket stuff. to London yeah. or to you know buy yourself a car, right? But we want to do it backwards. We make money. The first thing is, I must buy a big car. I must <laughs> live in a house, as in on the yeah. island. I must do yeah. all these like amazing things, right? Mm-hmm. That are fantastic, mm-hmm. but we're not. They're putting us. Um, they're putting us in a financially unhealthy place because we're putting the cats before the horse, right? Yeah. People yeah. want to they want to live like Dangote and and drive the same kind of car that Dangote drives. Mm-hmm. But we we're not asking ourselves if we're making the same kind of money that Dangote makes. That Dangote right? is making. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So tell me, it's really interesting. Tell me what um. Tell me what. Your first, because you sh- you had shared with me at one point that some of the students that you were now teaching financial mm-hmm. literacy skills, I felt I that was such a powerful thing um, for me that somebody would read my book, right? That's me. I sat in my pajamas. I was writing <laughs> in my home office. Will read my book. Someone who has never met me and decide that they're going to a create that video series, which I. I, it's like the most blown thing that has happened to me to um, decide that they're going to teach others. Like, and I think that that is so, it's so amazing. It's so powerful. And I know you shared that you, um, you had questions that some of the students um, had. I am. Yeah. So um, a lot of times when I, when I teach my class, like I told you, I always recommend your book as a recommended, like, you know, read the two books I recommend are your book and the richest man in Babylon. And every time um, young people read this book and um, they have a lot of questions. So I try to break them down to about, I have four questions here. Um, questions that reoccur from your book and it would be mm-hmm. amazing if you can give us answers. So the very first one is the fact that um, many young people my age can't really relate with Zuri's story. Mm-hmm. Um because it says she earned 600k a month you know she's living in some nice house she has a car you mm-hmm. know and all of that so um many of them who um i deal with cannot really relate with that story but then my question is how can they still implement these money smart strategies you know mm-hmm. that you shared like saving having an emergency fund you know i keep drumming into their head to have an emergency <laughs> fund and then they're like three to six months of my living expenses. I don't even have one month of my living expenses. And you're telling me to have an emergency fund. So I know that, yes, these strategies 
apply to those who are earning 600k mm -hmm. and those who are earning 5k it's mm -hmm. there are strategies that have stood the test of time but my mm -hmm. question to you is how can we encourage such young people who can't really relate with Zuri's story? How can they still be encouraged to pick up the strategies and run with them? So that's my first question. I love this question because it actually comes up a lot as um, a criticism of the book, right? So yeah. people, I, people always say, I, say, I read your book, I love it, it sounds amazing, but guess what? Me, I'm a low-income earner. I don't earn the kind yeah. of money that Zuri earns, right? Or uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. Zuri and her friends earn. Like they're well, uh -huh. they're well to do um, because yeah. they earn six hundred k. Um, they earn or uh, Zuri earns six hundred k a month, right? Now this was my this was my thing. So writing from that perspective of somebody who earns six hundred thousand naira a month, right? Yes. Was yes. The point. It was intentional. Okay. And I'll tell you, okay. why. it was intentional because in Africa, we're, because of our history with poverty and everything, we're yes. in love with the rags to riches story. We like to yes. hear about somebody who <laughs> had nothing and they're, they're from the bottom. They are blown. They are blown. Yes. As in, yes. As in, the, the reality is so the focus is always on earning, right? But the mm -hmm, reality mm -hmm. is, most people don't go from extreme poverty to extreme wealth. It's going to be a very mm -hmm. small percentage of people that go from extreme poverty to extreme wealth. Right? To extreme wealth, Most yes. Most people yes. are going to go from poverty to lower middle class or to upper middle mm -hmm. class. But what yeah. I saw was, was that mm -hmm. because the focus is on that rags to riches story, eh, we don't yeah. focus on the middle bit. There's no narrative for the middle bit. And yeah. there are more people in that like middle class. Um, there are more people who get to that middle class part because they focused on. They've been told get a good job, start a business that can um, create an engine for wealth, right? Focus on that. Mm -hmm. But because they've not also yeah. started keep and growing, there's so many people who um, enter the middle class and they're living from paycheck to paycheck. So they look yeah. like money right yeah they look like money you see them you can see them on instagram they they have nice, nice hair, cars they, nice bath yeah. they have nice uh, wardrobes they do go on all the expensive trips and everything but they're broke they might live a more hmm. expensive lifestyle but they're broke because they make 100 million they spend 100 million with no assets right? <laughs> yeah. so there's nothing to put, you yeah. can't put a proportion of that money into something else that is going to be create that's mm -hmm. going to appreciate in value and make money for yeah. you, right? So yeah, yeah, because there are plenty of people in that um in that situation, and we ha we don't tell that story enough. Even the people who are aspiring to earn six hundred k a month feel like you know what? All I have to do is make more money. If I make more money, then I will be fine, right? And then they get there yeah. and they yeah. know. <laughs> It's a mm. shock because nobody yeah. is really it's talking shock. about that. That mm -hmm. we, we get to that point and it's like, I made, I now make this money. I can now afford this lifestyle, right? So yeah. it doesn't matter because I'll always make money. But then things happen. People die. Yeah. People lose their jobs. People lose the burdens yeah. in their households. Uh, different things yeah. like businesses fail and you don't have mm -hmm. any plan. You because yeah. what happens is our consumption tends to rise to meet our income, right? Of course. So of course. You, you start earning more money. And or you start spending you, more. You start spending more money. So I or. always ask people, think about when you were in NYSE. Well, you don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were in NYSE and you were earning a lousy salary and you're like, oh my God, I can't wait to start <laughs> salary. And then five years later, you're earning like 10 times, 20 times what you are earning but you're still yes. broke hmm. you're still broke right because mm -hmm. you now earn 10 times it was supposed to be about more money right you now earn sure. 10, 20 times what you were previously earning but but mm -hmm. now you're still broke you're still in the same um um cycle so i wanted to write <laughs> it so that even if you are a low income earner and you are aspiring to get to that 600 um, K job, you're aware yeah. of what can happen. 
right? You are aware that, that Zuri, um, you know, even if she earned 600K, she found herself one, two, three things happened and mm -hmm. she was completely broke. So a person who yeah. has 50K can be asking, how can you be broke? But she's broke yeah. because she can't pay her bills. <laughs> yeah. She's broke because she does not have anything of value as in Big money uh, yeah. to her Perfect. name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so it's about learning the discipline, right? When you have a little, right? So yeah. that you know what to do. You have the tool, you have the financial literacy tools to make better money decisions. Um yeah. when you're making more. And you know, it's not, mm -hmm. my book, my book is not about depriving yourself. My book is not about saying, oh, focus on assets and don't um Focus on assets and don't enjoy your life, right? It's about yes. understanding that you have to build the assets systematically. And you knowing that allows mm -hmm. you to make better decisions because what you're going to invest is a part of your budget, right? You're of course, of course. You're not intentional about how you're spending on your lifestyle. You now have a better mm -hmm. idea um, of how, you know, your, your what do you call it? of how your money decisions um, affect you long term. Mm. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think the answer is really, really clear. Um, okay. So my second question is, um, I loved how the main character had a bond with her friends. Mm -hmm. um, and that really pushed me to reevaluate my friends because that really resonated with me because at a point, I became the money lender. Okay, I'm so sorry for you and my friends. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not going to call names. But at a point, I felt like I became the money lender in, in you know, you know, everyone knew that, oh, if I hit Christine up and I'm like, yo, man, I need 10K, I beg, I beg, I beg, try for I'll try for the guy. And then me feeling so, oh my God, if I say no now, I will give. And then we start dragging about paying back and not paying back, right? Mm -hmm. And then that was one thing that pushed me because I realized that I can't be the only one with this knowledge. I can't be the only one who's earning from other streams of income. And then my friends just are always asking for money or random people think that because mm -hmm. I'm not crying about my woes, then I, mm -hmm. I have money. So I have money to be spending. So I loved how at a point Zuri had to really bring up that conversation with her friends yeah. And they became accountability partners. So our question now is, how can such young people, now referring to the young people in my first question, how can they build a bond with smart money people? Like, especially for those who don't even have that kind of people in their corner. Mm -hmm. How can they, are they to throw your friends away? Are they <laughs> to start making new friends? Or are they to start fussing? Because it's not all of your friends that are going to even accept this yeah. new knowledge. You... Yeah. I mean, I, I, I told a story one time on my WhatsApp, I, some of my followers remember, about how I had approached a certain lady to learn a skill because I was really concerned about her money situation. She was always crying about money. And I said, okay, I will pay for you to learn a skill. I won't give you money. But what skill do you want to learn? And she actually told me she didn't want to learn any skill. Yeah. So I know that it's not everyone that's going to really key into what I know you want to do. But how can you advise young people like us to build that kind of community around ourselves. Yes. First of all, buy the smart mm -hmm. money tribe. Yeah. <laughs> so my second book, the smart money tribe, right? Is yes. um the theme one of the core themes is about how um to make your friendship circle your money circle. And mm -hmm. it's it's about how our friendship circles can affect the way we spend the way we invest the way um you know we earn right so mm -hmm. how you make money right what, think about what when we say your net worth is your network right yeah what we're yeah. Really saying is you need relationships to give you access right mm -hmm. um access to markets access to capital access to distribution access to pr Mm -hmm. Right? So, yeah. no opens doors for you, right? So, that's why they say your network is your network. So, your, the, who you know can affect how you are able to earn. So, you have yeah. an idea and you need, for example, I want to write a book, right? Um, yeah. Who do I know that is, that 
can do PR for me? Who do I know that yeah. can allow it? Who do I know that I can leverage on their distribution um, network? Um, mm -hmm. Who do I know that, you know, I'm doing a project? Who do I know that can introduce me to the MD of a bank or to yeah. a VC or... Do you get what I mean? Your, your I do. circle gives you access, right? But also, your circle also affects the way you spend and whether you invest or you don't invest. So we're all independent yeah. people. But I found that when you hang around people a lot, right, you tend to talk like them, you tend to, you tend to, does that happen to you? Like you start talking like your friends. Like if your yeah. friends start like a slang, like you start like saying it as well, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what so what we sometimes, even if we're in our own individual people, sometimes we're affected by the circle that we're in. So if your circle is constantly talking about how to buy this or how to, Oh, you don't have you don't have this bag. Oh, you don't have this shoe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. you're going to be doing, right? If if yes. your if your circle is constantly talking about okay, yeah, bag and shoe, fantastic, that one self day, but business, <laughs> what's yes. your sales strategy, boo? Right? What's mm -hmm. your um, what are you investing in? The reason I wrote the second book, or one of my motivations for the second book was because I realized that when I was in a room with men, and when I was in a room with women, eh, the conversation was also different. different. <laughs> Boys, when men are together, they will gossip, but they will talk yeah. about what's happening in the capital markets, what they're investing in. They will compare investment returns. They will talk about mm. the deals that they're working on. And these things, right, affect the way that um, that we think. It affects what we're talking about. It affects the information that we have access to, right? So mm -hmm. if you're just talking about, if you're just talking about, you know, spending, 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 and you're not talking about how to grow your business, you're not sharing ideas about, you know, building assets like, oh, I bought land here, or they're selling it at a discount, you don't have access to that information, right? So, mm -hmm. but I also recognize that it's not everyone that you're friends with that thinks like you when it comes to money, right? Yes. It's not everyone that you're friends with that is going to be industrious. And that's okay. But yeah. I think, first of all, it's about being self-aware enough to, to be connected to what brings you joy so that you're not affected by other people. Right, mm -hmm. so that nobody can pressure you to do certain things, but I think it's also important for you to cultivate the right friendships. If your friends are always are not talking about the kind of stuff that you want to talk about, why don't you teach them? Mm -hmm. Why don't you start talking about it? Right, in yeah. my own friendships, that cool. Um, I'm lucky because my best friends there's three of us, I mean, there's four of us, so I have three best friends. Um, they We've known each other since we were 10 years old. We went to secondary school together. We, um, <laughs> we've gone through everything together. Marriage, divorce, childbirth, child loss, you know, all kinds of things. Um, so over, over the years, and it's weird to me because we're all type A personalities or we're all very strong wow. personalities like individually. But yeah, and we're all very different right the way that we spend money is different the way that we um mm -hmm. the way that we think about you know stuff is different our interests um in are, some different. are different but yes. we're connected by our values we're connected by mm -hmm. our shared history so i have a friend that is obsessed with bags and i have a friend that's obsessed with shoes and i have a friend that's obsessed with i don't know beauty products or whatever right but me the kind of things that I love that really truly really bring me joy are experiences. So I like to go on holidays. I want to do activities that the things that truly make me happy. Um, yeah. Involve you know going to restaurants, doing activities and stuff. So if we go on holiday, right? <laughs> uh -huh. One person goes. To, let's say we're in Dubai. One person wants to go to the Gold Souk. Another person yeah. wants to go to the mall. Me, I want <laughs> to be in the hotel. Like <laughs> like. Just chilling and a book or doing something yes. or, you're doing yes. an actual activity so we're all different and that's okay yeah. but mm -hmm. we will have conversations about so me and my best friend Nana 
she owns a beauty supply store called Utopia. Yeah. She yeah, carries Utopia. products from all over the world to help women with um, um, dark skin. Listen, we have conversations every week about oh, sales strategy, about distribution, about logistics. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have those conversations, you can't help each other. Because mm. you don't know who knows you don't know who knows what, you don't know who knows mm -hmm. who, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's just understanding your differences and and cultivating um, mm -hmm. those conversations, those relationships in a way where, okay, yes, we talk about all those other frivolous things, but we also talk about things that matter. We also, we also share in each other's problems and each other's, um, you know, businesses or ideas. Sometimes your friend might not be able to give you capital. Sometimes your friend might not be able to um, to give you access to distribution, but sometimes they might help you test the validity of your ideas, right? Or sometimes, brainstorm. Yes. Exactly. Sometimes they, you might mm -hmm. you might just need to you know use their brain to test. Oh, is this thing going to work, right? And they will give mm -hmm. you their time, you know, to do that. So I feel like everybody brings everybody in the. Um, in the friendship circle should bring something to the table and in the mm -hmm. in the book in the small money tribe i describe the five types of friends that you should have if you're trying to build um a money um circle yes mm. all right okay thank you so much <laughs> so we have two more questions left okay so um this didn't really come out really strongly in your book Mm. But I'd like to hear your opinion on it because I think there was one time on one of your book tours. I think mm. I think you got to South Africa. I'm not really sure. Okay. Um, but then yes, yeah, you spoke about how you were shocked that women in I think South Africa were experiencing mm. the issue of black tax. Mm. And I just realized in this COVID period that at <laughs> 25. I am <laughs> suffering from black tax syndrome. <laughs> okay, for anyone who doesn't know what black tax is, it's basically the financial pressure or obligation, you know, to your immediate or um, extended family to support them, especially if you're a black professional. Now, I know I'm not a professional, but because I have some, some kind of income coming in, there's this expectation from my family um, that I need to give them money. So mm -hmm. I get called like... And I need money, send me money, or something is going on. I see that happen to my mother a lot. Mm. Um, it does me and my mom. So I see a lot of the black tax she has to pay in court mm. to her extended family. And I mm. was conversing with a friend of mine who has a hair business, and she was just, you know, sharing with me how pressured she feels that because her family sees her that her hair business is doing well, mm. they just keep placing demands yeah. on her. So my question is, how can we deal with black tax? The only successful thing I've been able to advise some of my students is that when I'm helping them draw up their budget, I advise that they put in a slot for family. Like they mm -hmm. allocate a particular amount of money monthly for their family and they stick to that and have money conversations to let them know that, look, I'm not picking this money from the ground mm -hmm. and this is what I can afford at this point. But mm -hmm. that's really all that... I can figure out. So, yeah. what can you tell us about handling black tax? Do you know, it's so funny because this is such a sensitive um, topic. So, I, I remember that in the first book, I touched on it a little bit with a Lara's little, character. Yeah. Yeah. With, Lara. so with Lara's character. Yeah. Lara was the one who, you know, she, of all her friends, she was making the most money. Um, and she, she wasn't married. She didn't have any kids. But she was spending a huge, she was so cost burdened because of her family. So she was paying, yes. she was paying her sibling school fees, she was paying her mom's rent and all of that on top of her own like expenses, right? So it was really, it was really um, tough for her. But I didn't even go, black tax was, was just something that was touched on. But when it really struck me was like you said, when I went to South Africa on a book tour and one of the things that were very, common or that came across very strongly was they connected a lot of women connected to lara's character specifically because of um of her situation right because a, women would come up to me and say i said i'm a second generation or 
first generation post apartheid um, kid. So my, my family sacrificed so much for me to go to school, go to university. But by the time I got my first job, right, I'm already, because obviously South Africa is a little bit different. They have more access to credit than we do. So they've already taken out credit cards um, and things like that to, and loans to look after their families' living expenses because it's now like, oh, now, okay, the time that we're going to reap our, our investment now. in our education yes. is now. You're yes. now making money, so you need to help us. And I feel yes. like as, as African kids, we feel a sense of responsibility. We feel a sense of guilt, right? Like mm -hmm. when it comes to our families and, and money. You feel like a bad person if you say no. You feel like, you know, like you're not being a good child if so if they call you to say we need this and it's like, do we not sacrifice for you? Because think about <laughs> it, in in Europe and all those places, there are real retirement plans. Like in America, you have your four hundred one k or whatever. In Africa, for the longest time, um, children were your retirement plan. Your retirement yeah. plan was I invest <laughs> in my children, and when they are now of um, <laughs> they will take care they of can me. make money then they will look after me that, that's yeah. how we were raised right but the thing is even if we want to come out of that we need to come out of it in a sustainable way we, mm -hmm. we, want, we need to help but in a sustainable way I always tell people mm -hmm. if you don't put your own uh, mask on first eh, mm -hmm. you cannot help other people Mm -mm. Do you get what I mean? Like, if you you cannot set yourself on fire to keep other people warm, right? Because what mm -hmm. happens more often than not is people now find themselves in debt. Yeah. And let me explain how it happens. Let's say you earn hundred k month, right? Mm -hmm. Your rent is due every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's say your rent is due in September every year. In March. You know rent is due in September. So there's money mm -hmm. in your account. There's, there's cash in your account. But some of that cash is for the rent. Then they call you from yeah. the village. Please, can you send us money? And in your mind, there's money in your account. So you have money, right? I, can, I have uh -huh. this money. I can, I can afford to give it to them. I'll be bad if I don't give it to them. But it's because we don't understand money. You don't have it. Rent is you not don't. a surprise. Rent is not mm. a surprise. It is something that you already committed to by the time you move into your house, right? So yeah. that money is not your own. It belongs to your landlord. Mm. So it's not <laughs> yours to give. Now, people now oh, end up in debt. They end up in debt yeah. because they want to be the helper, this good Samaritan that helps. Then you help. Then you start preparing. Mm -hmm. Ah, mm -hmm. paper, please come mm. and give me money. I, I can't get <laughs> my rent. <laughs> no, this was not. No, it, it, you're laughing, but it's so. It is. It is what happens like all the time. It's like yes. now you can't pay your rent. You've now taken debt to pay your rent because so debt that you gave yeah, wow. some of the money that should have gone to your rent or to your yeah. bills mm -hmm. to your family. Now you couldn't afford mm -hmm. it. The reason that you thought you could afford it is because you don't have the financial literacy tools to teach you how money works. We don't know yes. what our income can support, right? Mm -hmm. So we just, mm -hmm. we want to stretch ourselves, right? And what happens is you're not perpetually like in a negative um, financial um, space. And mm -hmm. what forbid you now lose your job on top of that or your business isn't doing well. If your family members don't have jobs to help you, you're on your own. You're on your own, right? yes. So the so bank of I, I, give some, I give some tips in yes. this mama you try. Yes. Um, it, <laughs> about yes. what you can do in that situation, right? Mm -hmm. Um yeah. so sometimes it might be they call you all the time, oh, we want to um do this, we want to do that, oh, I want to start a business, I just finished school. Maybe start a revolving fund, right? Mm -hmm. Example. Let's say you say, okay. So this year, all I have to give towards this family is 500k. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this 500k is going to be in a fund that will be for all of you. Let's say you have siblings, right? Mm -hmm. If Amaka comes and takes from the money to start a business, right? 
Yeah. He must pay back. Right? Mm -hmm. So that yeah. Obina can also can have yeah. access to this when he wants it. So it now becomes their own problem. Yeah. They now start to police each other so <laughs> yeah. to bring the money back. <laughs> yeah. You understand why? <laughs> they start to police yes, each other to bring the money back. Yeah. So in now you've given them them something to teach them how to um to start a business or to do something that that gives them um their own income so that they're not um always dependent on you. Another tip is make a make um write a set write is um write your a set of criteria down of what what constitutes health. What do I define as as something that um i have to do is it if someone is ill is, mm -hmm. it, is it if someone is you know in like real trouble make a list of things that con constitute help for you right mm -hmm. so so that you know if someone comes and says eh, i need to buy books wait till next term because this is not an emergency or oh, i need a side hustle I need a phone for me. I need it exactly. I, I need, need a phone. phone. I need a phone. phone. Yes. Go and get a job. Just yeah. go and get a job if you need a phone. Yeah. So so there are tips like that. There are more tips in the small money tribe. So I'm not gonna tell you all of it. Still go and buy the book <laughs> or sign up for my yeah. personal finance coaching card um sessions. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, but yeah, okay. like, I think I think it's a huge problem in Africa, and it was it was one of the things that made me realize how connected we are. Like we're as Africans, right? We're from different parts. We're we're different in so many ways, but we're so similar in so many ways. Because when I was hearing this, I was hearing these stories in South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and I was like, oh my god, we experience this in Nigeria as well. Like it's just mm. in different. It's the same thing, but in different like formats. Hmm. Oh wow! Well, I I I am mm. mind blown. I've been writing and writing, <laughs> so now I have more things to ponder on, even personally. So mm. my final question from your book, um, is um referring to the chapter where Zuri gets to attend Wimbis. Mm. And which I hope I will attend one day. <laughs> but yeah, she gets to attend Wimbiz. Amen. She gets to attend Wimbiz and then she meets Iaologi. And mm. she, you know, the issue of mentorship, you really hammered on mentorship in mm. that chapter. Um, now my question is, how can young people now for her she was able to meet um, Abafo, Mrs. Abafo Williams mm -hmm. and Yaologi. She met them in mm -hmm. person at Wimbley. Mm -hmm. at Wimbley. Mm -hmm. Now, because she got the chance to meet these guys mm -hmm. or these ladies. Now, my question yeah. is, especially with now COVID, you can't really gather in one mm -hmm. place. You might not meet these people. Like for me and mm -hmm. you now, we haven't met in person. We've met mm -hmm. in person. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the, the, the factor of social media as well. You might not be able to, you know, get through to the people you want to mentor mm -hmm. you. Yes, there's the part where they mentor you from a distance. Now, I would say mm -hmm. that has worked when it comes to your mentorship over me because I follow you a lot. But then mm -hmm. there's this part where you need a physical touch, a personal connection. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how can you advise young people to access mentorship opportunities, especially with the social media, will I say barrier? Mm. How do you think that they can still shoot their shots? That they can still <laughs> give that pitch, that elevator mm. pitch, even when they've not seen these people. How can I present myself that mm -hmm. they would think I'm a scam? Because it's true that mm. social media is receiving. But what if mm. I really I need to be mentored by this person? I feel like this yeah. person fits can really, you know, help me become the best version of myself in a mm. particular area. What would you advise? Because I know you. I, I'm sure you get a lot of mentorship requests. You're mm. probably mentoring some people right now. What do you, how can you, I don't know. Yeah, that's my question. That's my okay. question. <laughs> yeah. So basically, yeah. Um, yeah. When it comes to this, this mentorship thing is so tricky because I think that it's now become, um, mentorship has become like a buzzword, right? So yeah. me, I have mentors, yeah. right? But 
the men the mentors that I have, I met organically. And I met at a time where mentorship was just a word that, you know, was in the dictionary as opposed to um, something that I had a real connection with. So I wasn't going out, you know, seeking um, a mentor, but I was lucky, right? So I have four mentors, um, Tara Fela de Rotoye, um, I met her when I was on an executive education course in Abu Dhabi, and we were both um, we were both doing the executive education course um, at INSEAD, right? And she came up to me while I was having coffee in the coffee break, and she was like, hmm. "Hi, how are you? My name is Tara Faladro Um, you know, what are I you hope doing? you didn't like ask." Oh my god. I don't even think you understand. At that point, I didn't really know who she was. Who she was, yeah. Because I had just moved back to Nigeria. I was ah. you know, I just moved back to Nigeria. Um, I was like in my early twenties, I was like twenty th- twenty-three or something. And mm-hmm. I didn't know. And it was interesting for me because it was my first it was the first time in a professional setting, right? That yeah. um, that someone had <laughs> It was the first time in a professional setting that a woman as in was nice to me, right? Like I was yeah. used to being yo- the young girl in the room that they're looking at like this and, you know, making snide comments about and whatever. But she was so friendly. Like she was so friendly that I almost didn't trust it, right? <laughs> but I think I, had, I remember that I had done NYC and I remember seeing a House of Tara like booth in camp right but that was all that was my only interaction with the brand now this is what i feel like what really made us bond was a she was used to being taking these courses and she's the youngest in the class because we were in a a room with ceos of insurance companies like cfos of banks like different things right like different men that were like older um and she was like please did somebody force you to come here (laughs) <laughs> now, no, I just like enjoy these things. I I like personal development. But what shook me with her was she knew her numbers. She knew about. She knew her business. She she could tell you like her brand story, all those things. And I had never really seen a woman do that in in that way like before. So I was like obsessed with her. And by the time we came to um back to Lagos. We were like this, like we were inseparable. And what made me respect her even more was the fact that she had, maybe she had five stores or seven stores max at the time. And we had this strategy plan or this execution plan that we had done um, in Abu Dhabi, right? Taro called me at 3 a.m. in the morning. I said, hey, so I was thinking that this, 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 this. And I now did my own strategy documents for her, right? For her business. And she, <laughs> she, what blew me, my mind again was her execution of everything that was in that um, document. So I always tell people in my head, when I have an idea, I'm always saying, what would Tara do? Right? Wow. Now, I'm explaining this story because it happened organically, right? But we, we became friends. You want a mentor that's genuinely invested in your progress. You don't want somebody mm. that you collect their business card, they don't really care about you, and then you're calling them, and it's like you're disturbing them, right? Yeah. My problems yeah. are tax problems. My problems are yeah. size problems. Okay, good. I hope you're not yeah. like you hear me call, call them <laughs> by name. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Austin Peters. Um, um, Ms. Fada or me, like they, I have mentors for different reasons, right? Like they've come into my life at different times, um, in different ways, but it's always been organic. So I think my own advice would be, you know, join things like Wimbiz, right? Where, where you have access and not just jo- where you have access to, um, powerful, successful Nigerian women, right? Be involved don't don't i remember one time someone asking me when maybe i was like 20 something or my early 30s 
someone walked up to me at a Wimbis conference. I was like, I said, I just want to ask you a question. I, <laughs> I joined Wimbis before you, but somehow, like, I don't understand, like, what's really <laughs> happening. Like, why? How come you're so, like, they like you? How come? Even they the competition. Or how? <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's very interesting. And then I asked a question. I was like, okay, so you, you, you've been coming to Wimbis before. I mean, when, when, um, when you come, like, what do you do? Like, do you only come to the conference? right and mm -hmm. she was like yeah i come to the conference i talk to people i collect business cards i network but you see what i now realized was the difference in what i was doing was and this was due to my other mentor um miss osaya lile she yeah. when she was chairperson of wimbis in fact before she was even the chairperson of wimbis she would force me into committees right so with the, with the conference you come there once a year for two days and there are only so many people you can interact with and it can only be so deep. But when you're in your course, right, it means that you're going to weekly meetings, you are, mm -hmm. you're meeting some of these women on a deeper, like, level. So you're building a friendship. So for me, um, I would say, you know, participate. I would say, don't think about, don't um, underestimate the value of mentorship from afar because social media has made us more connected so you now automatically have access to knowledge and people that you didn't have access to before so i feel like social media has democratized our access look at how beautiful mm. what is happening is now right i noticed mm. you because you created value for me mm -hmm. right you created value yeah. for me i wrote this book I have thought a thousand times, right? I have thought a thousand times, oh my God, I need to do a video series of each chapter. I need to do a video talking about my motivation for each chapter and talk about the lessons and all of that. I wrote the book, the first book in 2016. <laughs> I've, st I've still not done it. <laughs> so somebody else sat down, read my book and was doing this. You are at it every week every single week you are posting like videos i would post it in my stories but i was like wow this is amazing now you've done something for me right that yeah. is valuable right yeah. yeah now you have my number in fact you've sent me lots of messages just to say ah, i said i just wanted to see this or i said i wanted to talk to you about that but you've added value so because you added value, you now have access to my time. Do you understand? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm more inclined to, you know, want to do things. Like, with mm -hmm. you. I'm more inclined to want to answer your questions because you yeah. added value. So, I think it's about, it's about building organic relationships. It is about, mm -hmm. um, it's about adding value, understanding what you bring to the table. I think that we, we, we live in a world now, our, this generation and the next is now very entitled, where we feel like, like, oh, auntie helped me, auntie helped me, or, oh, I went to win this, or I, did, I went to meet this woman, she just ignored me. Nobody owes you anything. Mm. Nobody owes you anything. Nobody yeah. owes you anything. Like, you can't, <laughs> you, you cannot, you cannot assume that just because somebody is a part of Wimbiz and, um, and you know, they you went to meet them and you said hello. Maybe they were not in the mood. <laughs> Maybe they were busy. Like I, 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 there was, I remember somebody coming up to me um, at a at one of my book events and saying, "Oh my God! Like I joined Wimbiz because of you. I now even joined the mentorship program. And then they gave me this mentor, but she's so bougie. She never has my time. She X Y. And I'm like." Oh, okay. I now asked her, <laughs> who, is, who is your mentor? When she told me who the person was, I was like, see, I don't know you, Anna, but let me give you some advice. Now, this person might, may not be um, one of the popular names, right? Yeah. But yeah. I can guarantee you that this woman, the access she has, if mm. she loves you, like how she will invest not just her time, her resources, her, her own network, as in, in mm -hmm. you, please don't misuse this opportunity. 
if she mm. is busy she is busy think about it successful people do not get successful by having time every day like, like yeah think about every time you ask someone for something imagine that there are 50 other people that have asked I'm them busy. right yes. like so yes. why would they prioritize you you, you have to stand out you have to invest in the relationship and I, and i thought i was like wow this is so interesting maybe because i my my mentor there they're genuinely my friends like genuinely like it's not it's not a it's not a there's respect it's like obviously because, because but it's, yeah. it's not it's, it's, we're <laughs> friends like we're guys yeah. like like yeah. i will call you to we i have invested so much in our relationship that i will call you in the middle of the night when i have a problem and i know see I, there are problems i have like this eh? cfd will be fast, fasting for me she'll be sending mm. me voice notes every morning my book is a health plus eh? because mrs alile uh, Miss Alile, Osai, stalked B Bookie George until she agreed to allow my book to be in Health Plus. Health Plus did not sell books. It was not part of their business model. But they started selling my book. She called her you, every day. You know, it was one thing, but she stalked her until my book got, got in Health Plus. Now, you have to ask yourself, someone you give a business card, you have a business card relationship with as a, a from an event would they do that for you so it's, it's really about just investing in growing like a friendship like a real friendship think about how you feel about your friends and what you would do for them and what they would do for you right that is what mentorship mm -hmm. you're learning from someone who can give you like a framework um you know to grow someone who has yeah. done something similar um, or mm -hmm. has, you know, built a business or built a career, mm -hmm. someone that mm -hmm. has wisdom and knowledge to give you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. All right. This has been so helpful. I want to believe that anyone who's here <laughs> with those questions, you know, <laughs> have gotten. So my four questions have been answered mm -hmm. um, concerning the book. So I think I would hand over to you. <laughs> Okay, so, well, we're kind of out of time, but yes. I wanted to say that, I, I think I want to talk a little bit about, um, I want to talk a little bit about my podcast, so I just launched a podcast, um, mm -hmm. wait. Mm -hmm. So I just launched a podcast. I'm posting the link here. Okay. Yeah, guys, um, go go to Anchor and listen to her podcast. Her podcast. Let me advertise this podcast for you. <laughs> so her podcast is so amazing, and in mm -hmm. the first episode, she speaks on her money mistakes. And mm -hmm. trust me, if you're listening to that podcast, I would actually advise you to have a pen and paper because when I was listening, I had like two pages full of you know, the stuff she talked about. And mm -hmm. I feel like if you listen to the first episode, it's such a good kickstart for whatever is going to come in the end because mm -hmm. she shares about her money mistakes and she's really open about it. And I feel like if someone is able to share their mistakes with you, it means that they don't want you to make the same mistakes. And mm -hmm. at this juncture, I think I'm going to mention one mistake that you mentioned that really struck with me. You talked about when you were saving to spend and not to build. Mm -hmm. So I know that for me, that was me because it was not like I was not saving. I had a very good saving habit because mm -hmm. I started saving from in my little piggy bank from like when I was like six. Mm -hmm. So the habit of saving was there, but I had the wrong idea. I was saving so I would buy nice stuff. Mm -hmm. So I would yeah. eat my food okay so that i would be independent and mm -hmm. i used to brag you know i used to brag and think, oh, i can't remember the last time my mom bought me a dress i can't remember the last time my mom bought me a phone but mm -hmm. i wasn't saving to build so i have advertised the podcast please go listen to it i'm wondering why people are saying they can't click on the link um mm. yeah the, the podcast link yes, is in my bio 
Yeah, yeah. The link is in my bio. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, like, <laughs> it was so interesting because I, I thought that the first thing, um, the first thing, you know, that I wanted to talk about on the podcast because I'd been wanting to do it for such a long time just so that I could have a platform to have these um, conversations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought one thing that makes me laugh all the time is when people think, Oh my God, Aristide, you write about money, so you must be perfect. Like you must yeah. do everything right. Like and you know, for me, like it was even just explaining about the fact that um, it is not it's not about perfection. It's about me teaching other people the strategies that I've learned from my own financial mistakes, um, and you know things that worked for me, and sharing it with others. So it's not about perfection. It's about creating systems around my money that remove me from the equation so that I don't do the things that come naturally to me. Um, so yeah. I, I really had fun with it. I, I hope that people enjoy it. I've got some really good feedback. Um, but please, please, please share with your friends. Share, you know, share it on Instagram. Um, talk about it. Subscribe. Leave me a review. I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much. This was awesome. This was this was awesome. Yes. If you can't click on the link, please go on the link in my bio. Thank you so much. I have so thank much you. fun. I did. I have so much fun. Thank you so much for um, doing this. Um, I'm so grateful um, to you for everything that you're doing in terms of financial literacy. Um, I think it's such an amazing thing that you're doing this for young kids. Um, and I'm here to help whenever you need it, whenever you need to talk, I'm here. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, please Thank write you. another book or something. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but we'll be here. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. 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 <laughs>